Hi, thank you all for joining today's WCET and Blackboard webinar, The Future of the Internet of Things is at Our Doorstep. The IoT can cover a huge territory of devices and equipment at an institution. How do we respond to the growing connectivity? What are the advantages? And risks. Today's webinar is moderated by Van Davis, Associate Vice President, Higher Education Policy and Research at Blackboard. Our speakers are Mike Abietti, Executive Director at WCET, and Mark Johnson, Chief Technology Strategist at MCNC and the North Carolina Research and Education Network. This webinar will be recorded and available on demand after today's session. We will respond to questions and answers throughout the presentation. Please type your questions into the Q&A box found at the bottom of the screen. Suggestions for how to learn more and stay connected are listed at the end of the webinar. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Van. Thank you again and enjoy today's session. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Van Davis, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Higher Education Policy and Research at Blackboard. <clears throat> And it is my pleasure today to moderate uh, what is um, the third in a series of webinars with w between WCET and Blackboard, this one on the Internet of Things. We'll do a quick overview this afternoon of IoT, and then spend a little bit of time doing deeper dives into the benefits and the risks that IoT poses for higher education. We'll have a moderated conversation, and as Sally just said, we'll work in questions throughout the uh, webinar. At this time, I'm going to ask our two uh, distinguished panelists to say a few words and introduce themselves. Mike, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Van. It's, it's indeed a, an honor to be here. I'm Mike Abiet, Executive Director of WCET and Vice President of Educational Technologies for the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education out here in sunny Boulder. And it's always an honor to, to work with you, Van, and to work with Mark Johnson. And this particular topic is near and dear to my heart, and I think we're, we're all in for some exciting times with IoT. And Mark? Hi. Thank you, Van. Uh, I, too, am <coughs> excited to be here. I'm the uh, Chief Technology Strategist at MCNC. We are the uh, the corporate home for the North Carolina Research and Education Network, uh, serving uh, not just higher ed, but all of education in North Carolina, as well as uh, running the North Carolina Telehealth Network. I think uh, this is uh, an interesting time to be looking at uh, the risk-reward analysis of, uh, of IoT, and uh, I think it's going to be a great conversation. Well, thank you, gentlemen. So let's start with a little bit of a brief overview of IoT to make sure everyone is on the same page. Um, whenever we look at the definition of the Internet of Things, uh, Gartner defines it as the network of physical objects that contain embedded technology to communicate and sense or interact with their internal states or the external environment. And very simply put, the Internet of Things is that growing network of smart devices that connect wirelessly and share information. And it's something that we've heard a lot about, especially now that we're only about two and a half, three weeks out of uh, the annual uh, Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, where IoT and especially how it interconnects with artificial intelligence was one of the hottest topics discussed. At this point, I think probably everyone has seen or at least knows of Amazon Echo and the way in which they have been able to use IoT uh, and specifically use Amazon Echo to connect a growing network of devices in people's homes. Everything from uh, thermostats that can control, learn and control the temperature in your house to cameras, security cameras, to smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors. We see the IoT popping up with people being able to have smart light bulbs that can be controlled through an app on your smartphone where you can adjust 
the light in your house wirelessly. And certainly, we've seen a lot of IoT develop with wearables, and probably the biggest category of wearable, wearables that folks are aware of would be fitness trackers. In fact, I dare say there's probably some folks on this webinar that got a fitness tracker for Christmas. So where are we today? Well, we saw a number of these devices were showcased at the 2017 uh, Consumer Electronics Show. That included everything from a smart toaster to looking at the way in which cars are going to communicate with devices and with the cloud in the near future. We're seeing, a, uh, as I said, we're seeing a number of wearables come up on the market, not just fitness trackers, but we're starting to see experimentations with uh, fabrics and that would be smart. Uh, one of the products that was <coughs> previewed at CES was actually a scarf that would uh, allow the user to be able to monitor pollution. Uh, in the air around them and filter those pollutants out. But we also are sometimes seeing an overcomplication. We see IoT in everything from a smart hairbrush to a smart coffee mug. And so this is this explosion of smart connected devices that are a part of this Internet of Things has also opened us up to security issues that we've never experienced before. Some of you may remember back in late October of last year, a number of major websites went down because of a DDoS attack that was done through the back door of smart objects. And so we see ourselves today in this world of more and more objects communicating providing us with more and more data. But that leaves us with the questions of how is this going to benefit higher education, an area that's all about the data, and what sort of risks and challenges does higher ed have to look forward to as we move into this brave new world? Mark, I'm going to put it over to you so that you can talk to us about the benefits of IoT and higher ed. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Ben. So I'm going to pile on to your uh, background a little bit um, by providing a little, a few facts around uh, what is the size of IoT uh, in terms of markets. And it's going to be, it's forecast to be $11 trillion by 2025. Uh, that translates to billions of devices. They're already estimated to be uh, something like 13 billion uh, devices, and that number could be 200 billion by, uh, by 2025. All of these devices will be uh, communicating and pushing data around. The amount of data is uh, almost beyond comprehension at this, this point. The, uh, we're going to be talking volumes of data with new words that we haven't uh, that haven't even entered our vocabulary yet. We expect to be talking zettabytes in 2020 and yottabytes uh, shortly thereafter, and then brontobytes, which is sort of my favorite uh, of, the, of the terminology for bytes, uh, for the data amounts, each of those being orders of magnitude larger than the ones before. Uh, it will touch everything we do from our homes to our cars to uh, all sorts of personal data information that's attached to us. You mentioned wearable clothes. That's part of it. Fitness trackers, other kinds of fitness devices, um, the industrial Internet of Things will be expanding and can uh, <clears throat> will touch pretty much everything that you can measure is going to be measured and will create data. The uh, Part of this is enabled by the dramatic drop and the rise of computing. Uh, we can see that uh, the price of computers in the last 30 years has dropped by something like 40,000 times. They're 99.9% .9 cheaper than they were in 1980. So this 
is a is a huge enabler for the Internet of Things. The uh, the we're at this intersection of great opportunity and oops uh, and ease to get things to market. So hardware costs very little. A uh, you know a Raspberry Pi is thirty dollars or something like that. You can get a free uh, fully functional operating system Linux that's open source and modifiable. Um, you can get a free user interface that goes with that. The Apache uh, web server is free and will run on those uh, $30 Linux machines. Uh, we have, we're approaching near ubiquitous wireless communication, so everywhere you go, you can count on having some sort of network capability. So the, what that leads to is even the simplest applications can have a full operating system with compute, storage, and communications that rival what a uh, departmental computer was 25 years ago, uh, and you can hold this in your hand. And in fact, many of you probably are holding that uh, something like that in your hand. Uh, smartphones uh, <clears throat> are definitely a uh, a great example. So, in the uh, to go on with some examples in the personal medical device arena, we have things like continuous glucose monitors. Uh, which monitor glucose levels for uh, for diabetics and insulin pumps, which can react to that today. Those are separate devices. Uh, as soon as you combine the glucose monitoring with the uh, insulin pump, what you have is an artificial pancreas. The technology is already there. It's probably mostly limited by uh, regulation at this point. We also have ever increasingly advanced hearing aids. Um, right now, those are somewhat limited in their rate of development, also by regulatory uh, rules that go with any medical devices. But um, if you combine that with the sort of things we expect from like noise canceling uh, headphones that you can buy on the open market, then, uh, then that gets dramatically better in the medical device world. And then <clears throat> you could extend that to uh, things like prostheses for, uh, for amputees uh, that can become smart. In uh, one of the most fully developed uh, areas for uh, entire ecosystems from Internet of Things is in the fitness industry. So uh, cyclists in particular tend to be Type A uh, professionals, and uh, so that you can get, you can instrument uh, your equipment and yourself uh, quite extensively with Internet of Things, uh, and get that information live while you're uh, cycling. You can push that to the cloud in real time for analysis, and there's a social media component. You can compare all that with your friends, and there is a big data component where those uh, where the data from all those people can be compared. So if, for example, you're a uh, you operate a, a park and uh, there are lots of uh, runners and cyclists who are are using that, uh, then you can see which trails in your park are used the most and make decisions about uh, how to uh, which trails should get the most maintenance effort, things like that. Um, you could apply that. Same sort of thing to uh, college campuses, for example, by mining the, the aggregate data to see where the most common running paths are, things like that. On the industrial side, um, it's Internet of Things is changing the way maintenance is done. So historically, machines were maintained on time intervals by saying you change your oil after a certain amount of time. Uh, every 3,000 miles, you change the oil in your car, regardless of what the state of the oil is. The next step on that is to examine the oil and say, and somehow observe the quality of it and decide when to uh, do maintenance based on that. And uh, the final, the holy grail of that is performance-based. So you analyze the performance of the machine and then decide based on whether the machine is degrading in performance when it requires preventive maintenance, which, of course, saves money. 
All these things can be applied uh, in a variety of areas. This picture happens to be an oil refinery, but this uh, happens. You can do this with car fleets, with uh, basically any kind of any kind of machinery. So uh, it's an enormous uh, set of opportunities, and we can we're only barely able to touch the surface on on where we're headed with that. I wanted to close with one uh, quick example. So this is a picture that I listed from a friend's Facebook page of a Pinewood Derby car he built while he was playing with his sons. So this Pinewood Derby car happens to be instrumented with Bluetooth radio, an accelerometer, and gyro, and a uh, wheel spin sensor, um, all fitting in a standard Pinewood Derby car for any of you who have been involved in the Cub Scouts, uh, and all for just a few dollars, uh, an example of what is possible today, and of course that would easily fit in the palm of your hand. And I should point out the person that did this is responsible for technology at a large appliance manufacturer now. So uh, you can uh, see this kind of thinking that's evolving in the traditional industries there. That's my last slide, I think. It's time to turn it over to Mike who will explain why all of those things are bad. Well, now, let me qualify, Mark, right from the beginning here, that, that I am a big fan of IoT. I, uh, I, my wife and I live in a small log cabin in Estes Park, Colorado, that uh, has 18 devices totally controlled by uh, our Amazon Alexa. And I drive up and down the mountain in my Porsche 911 that's totally IP connected, and I can get all the kinds of data that I want to get. Uh, however, there's another side of that story. IoT carries risks with it, and I just want to give some, some facts uh, here this afternoon, and we can have a little discussion. One of the risks is that IoT is here now. I can remember it wasn't too long ago that uh, people were saying, well, IoT is going to be here in five years. It's going to be here in seven years. But all of a sudden, IoT is here now, and it's growing at amazing an amazing rate, as Mark said earlier and it's reaching out into every area of our lives and doing so very, very rapidly. And as Van said, IoT is a very serious security risk to all of us all the time. And as a matter of fact, because of IoT, in my humble opinion, we've come to the realization that there really is no such thing as security. There is only acceptable degree of risk. And so we're having to stop and think about how we do and what we do, particularly in higher education. One of the most interesting facts that I've been following for years is that technology now moves from the home to the institution instead of vice versa. That makes it very difficult for those of our audience out there who are in the business of, of managing and planning and, and purchasing and, and operating uh, institutional uh, technology infrastructure uh, it's getting very, very difficult. As a matter of fact, when the, the, the reality is we today in higher education are, are besieged by students coming to our campuses either in Internet-connected cars or via high-performance networks such as the, the excellent network that Mark has, and they're carrying with them Many, many, many devices, and you'll see different numbers anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 IP-connected devices. And as we added today, many of those devices are wearables, and they're highly mobile. And each one of those devices presents a, a new security issue for our campus professionals. No longer can the, the uh, infrastructure, the IT infrastructure problem, just be handed to the CIO and say, take care of that? Uh, because now the picture, because of IoT, the picture is much different. It's so hard to plan for even how much bandwidth you need on your campus because you don't know from semester to semester what devices your students are going to bring, how many of them are going to replace your light bulbs with their light bulbs that are controlled by Amazon Alexa, are fully dimmable and play music. We don't know how many of those coffee machines in the faculty lounge 
that are IP connected are going to be security problems on our campuses. And that comes from the, my, my fifth fact there, that U.S. citizens spend at least 5.5% of their discretionary income on personal technology. Now, I, I follow this through the American Institute of CPAs, and they usually have some pretty good data on how much money we really spend. This equates to 17% of our mortgage or rent payments spent on personal technology, most of which, obviously, is IoT-related. And what we're finding is that many of our higher education institutions are not really prepared to handle IoT. And that, that happens for several reasons. First of all, our state legislatures are, are really not that well schooled on what IoT is, even though the majority of them, as they get to be younger legislators, are wearing the, 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 the health tracking devices and all kinds of other devices, and everyone is carrying a, a smartphone, and uh, you know their, their vehicles and their homes are connected, and so on, so on, and so forth. Still, that doesn't translate to making purchases for higher education. And our research labs and academic sandboxes are certainly gearing up. They're doing an amazing job of, of, of not only studying the devices that exist, but also creating new devices. So we are, in doing our daily jobs, creating more of challenge for ourselves and our, in our, our institutions, whether it's research or, or academic or, uh, you know, whatever area we might like to talk about. Uh, a good example of that is the, the uh, incursion of artificial intelligence into the higher education environment. And, you know, we would like to think that these devices will, will first impact in the classroom, but that is not true. What's happening now, the artificial intelligence engines are impacting the administrative suite much more than they are the actual academic classroom uh, because the commercial sector has been able to, to capture, if you will, some of the, the wealth of AI resource and, and try to apply that to the admissions process, uh, apply it to the, the planning uh, process, the finance process, all of those administrative tools and tasks that have to occur every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, on a higher education institution. So the and that's the, the artificial intelligence control of all these IoT devices is just reality. It's just the way it is, and it, it's the devices, the apps, and services are going to continue to proliferate in the foreseeable future. There is far too much uh, uh, benefit, as, as Mark was saying, from the, the generation of need and then meeting those needs with multiple devices, uh, devices that, as we sit here, we really can't imagine what they're going to be. But just the other evening, I, I know many of you heard that uh, on television there was a commercial for the Amazon Alexa. And you'll have to, I'm sure you'll hear Alexa say something here because she's right behind me. But the television commercial talked about, there she is, talks about ordering some toys. Well, there, there's such a proliferation of these AI engines in the homes, and they're, they're so independent that the, the, uh, the uh, device in question, I won't mention her name because she'll talk back to me, actually ordered those toys all over the United States. Now, that is significant. No, no question about that. And, and that is indeed a risk that we have to think about. So having said that, there is no question that IoT and higher education is, a, is absolutely an amazing phenomenon. But we've got to temper that excitement with the fact that there are risks here and we all need to keep those risks in mind. And we've got to, in some way, and I really don't know how, in parallel, be able to mitigate the risk as we're able to harvest the amazing bounty of applications that IoT can bring to our higher education institutions. So having said that, Van, I'll turn it back to you. 
Well, thanks a lot, Mike. Thanks a lot, Mark. You know, we've already gotten a couple of good questions, and so I, I think one of them segues very neatly into what you've been talking about in the direction that we wanted to make sure that we discussed today. Um, Tom Dolan over at Texas Tech University raises a very real question. That what about the risk of someone figuring out how to use IoT to replace an academic program, to replace faculty? I mean, I think many of us know about the Georgia Tech experiment last year uh, where they leveraged IBM's Watson uh, to create a virtual teaching assistant, Jill Watson. Uh, and many of the students, and these were graduate students, did not realize that they were interacting with basically artificial intelligence, with a bot, uh, until after the end of the semester when they were informed about that. So let's set the nuts and bolts aside for a moment, gentlemen, and let's talk a little bit about what's the, what are the larger academic risks and challenges that you think that IoT is going to face, for faculty especially? Okay, Van, and, and, do you want me to start with that? Yeah, I was just about to say, why don't you start us out, Mike? Okay, yeah, the, the reality again is that these types of artificial intelligence and IoT-based engines are there. The risk is we allow the capabilities to overtake the, the human responsibility that we have in higher education, particularly faculty and then the, the administrative uses that I mentioned before. And I think this brings, this is a perfect place to bring up the issue of ethics in IoT and artificial intelligence. And, and Mark, if I may, I'd like for you to relate some of your experiences in North Carolina relative to ethics and artificial intelligence. <laughs> so <clears throat> the North Carolina uh, Independent Colleges and Universities Association runs a uh, uh, an ethics bowl every every year, uh, which looks like a uh, I guess the format's kind of like a traditional college bowl, except the teams are presented with ethical situations. One of the so it was. Uh, Ethics and technology was the topic for last year. Uh, one of the questions, which I thought was particularly good, or one of the scenarios, was uh, one you've probably heard before, which is the uh, autonomous car approaching a tunnel, and a toddler uh, darts out in front of the car, and then so the car has to make a decision that would either kill the occupants of the car or kill the toddler. And but the question posed to the teams was who gets to make the decision for what on how to program that car? So is it the, the junior programmer that just started work at uh at Tesla or is it uh the legislature? Is it uh you know where where does that uh responsibility go for making those kinds of decisions. I think the, the ethics of how uh, artificial intelligence works and um, IoT, how IoT interacts. I see we had another question about how will medical information be handled when you have uh, on-body sensors for folks. I think it goes right into the same kind of situation. Uh, where does the line, where do you draw the line between uh, collecting fitness data and collecting medical data. Did, maybe your insurance company wants to see what your heart rate was when you were uh, when you were out riding. Um, so I think those are going to be a lot of tough questions that uh, may not need to strictly be handled by technologists. Well, let, let me ask you a, a follow-up, gentlemen, um, about the issues of IoT and data and educational inequity. Are there ways that you think that the data that we gather from all of these connected devices on our campuses could be used to try to close the equity gap in higher education? Or are we looking at some unintended consequences here of actually making that equity gap grow even larger? Uh, Van, this is Mike. Uh, 
in, in my opinion, the answer to your to both your questions. Uh, are yes. Uh, are there ways to to create a more equitable environment in higher education utilizing these technologies? Yes, there are. Are there ways to increase the gap? Yes, there are. What we've got to do is is be sure that our institutions actually have an IoT strategy. You know, if you allow the technology to do what the technology would like to do, it will indeed do that. Uh, and it, technologies are designed to be used for specific purposes. And if we take the time to create this strategy and decide, and quite frankly, every campus won't have the same, uh, the same need, the same values, the same uh, equity position as every other campus. And these, these technological tools need to be used toward, toward the end that is part of the strategy for the institution. Uh, otherwise, it, it's kind of a willy-nilly thing, and, and this harkens back to the day when we first came out with online education. And I know that in that audience, there are some gray hairs like me sitting out there uh, that were were told that well, we can't do this online thing because it's going to replace all our faculty, and it's going to do away with brick-and-mortar campuses, and so on, so on, so forth. If there's anything that we should have learned from that experience, is we need to have a strategy to stay at some point ahead of the, the, the evolution of our new technologies, or we're going to end up putting out fires uh, and, and not, not doing the job that we know we need to do for our students. Well, Mark, let me ask you a follow-up to what Mike just said. Mike talked very eloquently about how our institutions are going to need to develop a strategy on how to deal with the Internet of Things on their campuses. You've worked with institutions all over North Carolina. How do institutions go about creating strategies for IoT, and what are the challenges that they face when they start thinking about IoT, and particularly all of the data that IoT creates? So I, I think this is an area where uh, campuses are struggling at the moment. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we've talked about how much data is created. Uh, Mike suggested the amount of uh, load that might happen to the network, but a, a uh, companion question to that is, will it, in fact, be a load on the campus networks as uh, uh, mobile networks get better and everybody is walking around with connected devices? Might the campus networks the traffic be reduced and actually lose control of some of where that uh, data is going uh, that's being collected from personal devices that are walking around or even there. Lose control of security uh, on the campus because you've got devices that are connected not just to the campus network but to other networks as well. Uh, this, is a, this is a big problem for uh, campus IT people and uh, I think most of them, all of us, are behind the curve on that. Well, so uh, let me ask a follow-up question. And, 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 Mike, I'm going to throw this back to you because I think that you've spent some time thinking about this. Whenever we create, I mean, you, you, you yourself said as you started that, that you're a great advocate of, of IoT, despite all of these risks. So we've talked a little bit about the challenges that institutions are facing in, in, around security and privacy and use of data. What do you think IoT brings to higher education, though, in the next few years that will allow higher ed to move in different and new and innovative directions? Well, Van, that's a great question. And, and I think what IoT is doing is accelerating the process of individualizing education. Uh, I think that we're going to see more and more and more stress on being able to uh, utilize, say, adaptive learning technologies and, and, and the data uh, about learning or lack thereof that would allow us to become better content experts, that would allow us to become uh, uh, more efficient 
at, at, at creating content-related outcomes for courses and degree programs, or quite frankly, whatever we call them from now on. Because IoT is going to exacerbate the, the discussion relative to digital badging, relative to the, the, the actual uh, reality of the degree itself. Uh, the, all the good work that you did on the $10,000 degree program, uh, you know, will we'll be revisited and, and will be uh, uh, accelerated because now the individual student, uh, without regard to race, color, creed, or, or national origin, uh, is going to have access to more content delivered in more ways than ever before. And again, that's, that's a, a two-edged sword. It's an amazing benefit, but it also carries some amazing risks. So I think that's what IoT is going to do. It's going to speed the process. It's going to cause us to think about things we've never had to think about before. And we are not going to have any place to hide. We're going to have to answer the questions. And, and that's just the way I feel about that particular issue. So, Mark, wanted... what do you think? Um. So, Mike, I would categorize his uh, or characterize his comments as applying to what we're already teaching people. I think part of the problem is there's a whole range of things that we don't have good educational programs for now. So uh, we're only beginning to get good data science programs for dealing with big data. Uh, there are really no degree programs for what I would call cyber infrastructure engineers, which are uh, the people that need to know how to look at a problem and then figure out how to amass the compute storage and communication that needs to go uh, to be applied to that problem to solve it using cloud, IoT, uh, whatever other tools you may have. There's just no good degree programs to, to do that. It's going to require more uh, rigor around software development. Um, so a lot of the problems that we see now uh, are because we have these cheap uh, devices, cheap hardware running open source, full open source operating systems, and there's not much rigor in the development around how you secure those systems in the first place, and <clears throat> and uh, and what the code should look like, and how and how reliable it is. The big DDoS attack that you mentioned, that was uh, driven by lots of uh, security cameras, uh, was a flaw. There was a full Linux operating system there that had a exposed password that the users of those. Uh, Video cameras did not have the ability to change to something else. It was uh, so the bad guys could get in via that uh, hard-coded password and do things. These are all poor development uh, techniques, uh, partially driven by the the hurry to get to all this money that's going to be flowing to IoT. So I think there's a huge new new sets of things to to be teaching folks. Uh, Related to this technology that uh, that we need to get to doing. So, that's so that a great point. To, uh, go ahead, Mike. I was going to say that's a great point. And uh, right now, as we sit on the horizon of IoT, uh, he's so right. We don't really know the skill sets required for success in manipulating all of this data. Our, our IoT slash data challenge is not hardware, is not software, it's skinware. It's the people that know what to do with all these tools and the data that we generate. So I think that, that leads us to a couple of questions that have popped up in the chat box that are um, pretty closely related. Patrick Finnegan <clears throat> over at Nazarene Bible College asks, uh, is there currently or will there be in the near future some form of guiding authority for IoT that is tasked with discussing IoT's future from the viewpoint of concepts of benefits, risks, ethics, and best practices? And then related, Tom Dolan over at Texas Tech um, 
asks how higher education can start participating in the design of IoT. Uh, if we're already using it to learn, how can we help shape this future uh, mechanically and ethically? And is higher ed represented at the proverbial table right now? Well, uh, I think. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I was going to say that the, the the two questions are indeed related, and they picked up on one issue that, that I see every day. And that is with all of the IoT information that we see online and we see on television, education, particularly higher education, is never mentioned. Uh, we are apparently not seen as a, a viable market. Uh, uh, and there's so much discussion about smart cities and, and all those kinds of things, and education is an afterthought. Uh, and there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of discussion about IoT going on globally. And there are organizations that you mentioned in other countries that do look at IoT, and they do have an, a, 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 a national IoT strategy. Uh, we just haven't gotten to that point yet. And, and I know, Mark, from the research standpoint that, that, that you have done and your team does all the time, uh, I'm sure you have some, some very, very good comments on this topic. Yes, yeah, so I don't think higher ed is completely missing in action. Uh, they're lots of research projects that are deploying uh, large numbers of sensors, so that's IoT, certainly uh, Argonne National Lab has a big project with the city of Chicago where they're instrumenting the city. Uh, that <clears throat> I don't think is translating very quickly from research activities to uh, education to policy. Uh, that, especially the policy side of that, tends to happen more slowly and uh, the the technology piece is cranking ahead very rapidly, uh, driven uh, again by this ease of opportunity and uh, uh, ability to, to turn turn things up very quickly into products, uh, especially quickly if you ignore uh, some of these ethical uh, and security issues that are out there. So uh, it's going to be tough to get in front of that. Um, it's going to take political leadership, I think, to get in front of some of those issues about, uh, if we're talking about guiding authority, that's going to take some uh, political leadership. Well, you, you, you gentlemen know, and go ahead, Mike. Well, I was going to say, uh, uh, in, in, some, in some real world examples that we see uh, of, of impact of IoT on higher ed institutions, uh, one of the most interesting uh, is when we deal with the, the legal community on our campuses. Uh, the data that is collected by all of these IoT devices uh, has been proven to be admissible in court. And, of course, it depends on where you are and what the case is and those kinds of things. Uh, but that, that is a gigantic impact on, on higher ed, and it, it shouldn't come as a surprise. However, Many cases it does because, as Mark said, the, the research and everything that's going on is, has not yet really translated well to the higher education community. So that, that leads me to another question. I, I think you gentlemen and, and some of the folks online know that I am a self about touched on policy a little bit. But what would you, if you could sit down, in front of your state legislators uh, and give them one piece of advice about IoT and higher education, what would you want them to know? What, what would your advice to that legislator be? Well, that's a, that's a great question, Van, because we, we struggle with that every day here at WICHE and WCET. Um, as a matter of fact, I have the same, I have to answer that question Friday afternoon <laughs> with a group of legislators. Um, uh, I think it, it's so extremely important that we help the legislators draw a parallel between what they're doing in their private lives with, with IoT and with personal technology itself and extend that to the, their, their professional thoughts as, as they're working as legislators and thinking about 
uh, making legislation that impacts higher education. Uh, this is one of the few areas, other than medicine, where our legislators are trending the same way that our students are. They're getting the same Christmas gifts, and they're, they're doing the same uh, health care and those other kinds of things that utilize these devices. Uh, so uh, what, what I visit with them about is drawing parallels between their personal life and the, the, the growth of the technologies on our campuses and understand that the, the, the challenges they have are multiplied billions of times and added to uh, on our, our institutions. I think that's Mark, what, what advice would you give would you give a, a good North Carolina legislator? Uh well I think Mike's comments were uh were spot on and uh the uh but also I think it's important to recognize uh that we don't always have to create new laws to deal with technology. In a lot of cases it's a matter of understanding what's going on and realizing that there may in fact be uh laws from the analog world that apply perfectly well um, if you can sort of filter out the, the technology piece of it. Uh, so I think um, HIPAA requirements are kind of that way. Um, the uh, It goes back to the ownership of the data and, uh, and who should be able to see it. And technology doesn't change the laws around that. It just uh, makes it a lot easier to that do things wrong, um, but the, the underlying law doesn't have to change. So I think uh, there's going to need to be some some effort to, to understand what's happening technology-wise, so that uh, where there are gaps in the in the law or the policy, those can be filled. So conversely, gentlemen, what would be the the biggest piece of advice that you would share? with a college or a university president about this future, the present or the future of IoT? Well, Van, this is Mike again. Uh, my, my standard response to that is a question, do you have an IoT strategy on your campus? And of course I get blank stares. Uh, and then we start talking about what that, what that really means. Uh, you know, how, how do you have a policy environment that indeed supports the goals that you have for your students relative to deployment of any technology? And then how does that apply when that technology is moving from the home or from the student to the institution itself? Because if you, do, if you haven't thought about that, you don't have guidelines, then, uh, you know, it's, it's a hurry-up process putting out little fires rather than, uh, and, and you can't plan for every eventuality, but you can plan for some of the big things. It's just like we do with emergency management, where we, we try to plan for the big things, which frees up mental resources and, and physical resources to help us handle those things that we didn't plan for. But if you ignore it, if you ignore the issue, and the issue in this case is being IoT, and, and try to hand it off to somebody else, then, then problems occur. So I just encourage the, the chancellors and presidents to get as involved as they can in understanding what's actually going on. And here again, they carry the same devices that the students do, maybe a little more expensive and may be paid for by somebody else, but they have similar challenges. And Mark, think, what about you? What would you tell a, a, a North Carolina chancellor? So the chancellors tend to be chiefly responsible for making sure the universities uh, or their institutions have the, the money to, uh, to continue long term, and they need to think about what the impact is going to be uh, of that. What is, uh, is IoT going to change? Uh, the way education is delivered? Is it going to change uh, their IT infrastructure on campus? Uh, I think it's going to touch, is it going to change the way research uh, happens? Uh, I think uh, Sherry Pruper asked who uh, is responsible in uh, 
owns data that may be uh, generated by IoT. I think that's a very murky situation now and something that uh, that's another potential policy area that uh, is going to need to be addressed and uh, there's going to need to be an awareness of. I have uh, seen speculation, for example, that uh, at some point in the future, uh, you may be given your refrigerator for free because your refrigerator uh, is aligned with a particular grocery store and when it automatically renews your order for milk, uh, that, that business will be going to the grocery store that the refrigerator is associated with and they'll generate enough income to give you the hardware. Um, but they'll own all the data. Um, that's already kind of the situation with Nest thermostats is uh, they own the software in the thermostat and it's not clear what happens if you <laughs> disconnect it and uh, can you even use that. I think we're going to see a lot of those things where it's hard to separate the data and the and the physical device and who owns what uh, will get a little bit murky. That may even be murky for cars. Uh, so uh, there's uh, the university chancellors are going to be need, need to think about where the money is and make sure that uh, that their campuses are looking at at all these issues. It's not just academic, but the business of running the university. Uh, it's now buildings, budgets, and business. So, so let me close by asking you, gentlemen, um, this question. If you had a crystal ball, paint me a picture of what you think a university or a college will be like in 10 years because of the Internet of Things. How is it going to show up? And what is it going to mean to that campus? What's it going to look like 10 years down the road? Mark, you want to handle that one? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to contemplate this picture. Um, so, I, you know, I think we're going to see the sort of traditional automation of physical things around the university. So uh, the, the, the physical plan of the university will get much more automated. Uh, that's probably not a big impact on things. Uh, I think you'll see tighter integration between devices that the students are uh, carrying around with them and the classes that they may be taking. Um, that uh, And physically having to go to classes will be, it'll be an interesting thing is how much that happens, that maybe classes that we think of as large lecture uh, kinds of classes uh, will tend to have less people in them and will go, will have a much more uh, small unit kind of scenario where uh, teams of students work on problems together because collaboration is going to be key. Uh, I think that sort of thing is probably not taught enough. Uh, in college, I mean, we're doing this uh, panel, and uh, no two of us are in the same place, uh, which is pretty normal for for my work day. But uh, I think that's a, a shock to students now, and we're going to have to they're going to have to get more used to working on that. So we may see more cross institutional teams working on problems. Uh, I'm not sure that's a great picture, but uh, there'll probably be a bunch of other stuff that hasn't even crossed my mind 10 years from now. <laughs> yeah, and, and Van, this is Mike. I'm going to go out on a, line, a limb here and say it's not going to look a whole lot different than it does today uh, because of the, the speed at which higher education operates. Uh, I think in 10 years our institutions will be more diverse. I think definitely that's true. And by diverse, I'm not only talking about diversity of, of student population, but diversity of technology deployments. And I think not only will it be more, more of the same, but it's going to be more expensive. Uh, and the reason I say that is because as of yet, uh, our think tanks, our sandboxes, and our, our, our groups that are doing the research have not really started to attack the economic and the financial impact of IoT or any other 
uh, really advanced technology on higher education. And I think I can put that into one capsule by saying uh, we had uh, an epiphany when the Internet was adapted to teaching and learning because that's not what it was designed for. We had another epiphany when we decided that we could create what we call online courses and distance education. And we're going to have another epiphany within this 10 years where the, the, the concept of online education and, and those kinds of things are, uh, are put into the same bucket with what we'll call technology-enhanced education. Uh, and that has, that has amazing impact. And, uh, you know, that's, that's going to that's gonna help us determine what our institutions look like in 10 years. So we're coming up on the top of the hour and the close of this webinar. Um, Mike, Mark, do you guys have any parting thoughts that you would like to leave us with? Oh, gee. I, I think that, it's going to be a wild ride, and it's gonna, things are going to turn out a lot different than we imagined. Um, if you look back yeah, 10 I, years, uh, I don't think we had Netflix then, for example. Um, the uh, And the, the iPhone is not quite 10 years old. So uh, imagine living without those two things now and think what it, 10 years from now might bring. It's going to be... Uh, can be different. I think uh, it's tough to predict. Excellent point. And, and, and Van, I would say we all should embrace IoT, but with an open mind and open eyes, and understand that there are some significant risks. And cybersecurity is just door opening. There are significant risks to any new technology. And now the technology is indeed ubiquitous. Uh, we need to be sure that our decision makers are fully informed and that that we we really pay close attention uh, to what what we mean by higher education and uh, it's going to be really an exciting time thank you all very uh, thank you very much gentlemen um, we've got our contact information up here on the screen uh, I know these two guys love to talk about this and so I'm sure if you have any further comments or questions, you can reach out. Also wanted to point out a couple of upcoming events that uh, WCET is putting on. Uh, first of all, you can always learn more about this and other issues via WCET's um, website. And a couple of upcoming events that WCET has coming up, uh, their leadership summit, uh, will be taking place June 14th and 15th, 2017 in Salt Lake City, and the annual meeting later that year in October 25th through 27th in Denver, Colorado. So thank you all very, very much, and uh, we hope that you will join us again for future conversations. Have a good day, folks. <laughs>